Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. As always, hello, I'm your decoder, Simon Wamsi. Well, one of my writers, this case, Kevin, writes me a script. This is one where we take a slightly different path because it's the internet's deepest mysteries. What this is, is Kevin has five mysteries from the depths of the internet. And some of them are true, some of them are false. So he makes up some stories and I have to guess. There is an intro video from Kevin, which I've already seen, but I'm going to roll now because I couldn't get it to work on any of my devices and ended up having to open it in Premiere. <laughs> to watch it. I don't know what was wrong with the file, but I've already seen it, and you will see it now. Roll it! Hello, Simon. It's so nice of you to join me again. Perhaps this time it won't be halfway through the f video, but I shouldn't complain. Last episode was your worst showing yet, but just in case you did forget about me again, I've decided not to confuse you by imposing any additional restrictions. While I enjoy the added gimmicks and how much harder they make it for you, I've decided this time to go back to basics will just be five mysteries, and you must decide whether they are fact or fiction. There were some scoring discrepancies previously, and currently the score stands at 14 to 6. With any luck, I could be in double digits by the end of this episode, and then I would only need one more episode to take the lead from you. I did see you trying to game the system last time, so just as a friendly reminder, all of the entries are in a randomly generated order. Don't try to resort to cheap tricks to win. That's my gimmick. Okay, so now we're all introduced. Let's get cracking. And uh, as Kevin mentioned, I'm absolutely dominating so far. So uh, that's right. That's right. Let's go. The TikTok mirror. It all began with a draft. Samantha Hartso, a 26-year-old resident of New... Sorry, the, the episode's called The Tick... The, the entry's called The TikTok Mirror, which already sounds like some sort of modern version of The Twilight Zone or The Outer Limits, doesn't it? Although they wouldn't say TikTok. They'd be like, Tok Tick because of copyright! <laughs> it's like, we all know what you're talking about! It began with a draft. Samantha Hartso, a 26-year-old resident of New York City, was annoyed by a cold draft that seemed to exist in her bathroom. She'd been living there for a while, but it wasn't until she returned for a from a weekend hiking trip that she noticed how cold it was making her bathroom. She asked her roommates if they could feel air entering their bathrooms as well, but nobody else had noticed anything. Curious, Samantha began investigating what could be the cause of the cold air entering her apartment. Uh-oh. <laughs> how, how do I declare this? Like, conflict of interest? Um, or whatever? Um, I already know this one, Kevster, so I think we're going to have to call it nil-nil on this one, and I'm just going to continue with the story anyway because I don't want to spoil it, <laughs> but I'll tell you at the end whether I knew it because the only person I'll be hurting is me. Upon searching the bathroom, she discovered that the air was coming from behind her mirror. Once she realized that the mirror wasn't firmly attached to the wall and could just be lifted off, she did what anyone in 2021 would have done. Samantha began filming her adventure and uploading it to TikTok. Four videos were uploaded in total. In the first video, she explained the situation, and the second showed her removing the mirror for the first time as to preserve her initial reaction. Behind her bathroom mirror was a hole in the wall. Okay, so I know that I know this so far. I'm familiar with this. The only question I have is, did she fake? it or didn't she fake it like i know this happens because i've even seen this video i just don't remember i guess the question kevin might ask me is whether that she faked it or not and that i do not remember at all behind her bathroom mirror was a hole in the wall her roommate john was filming at first and just believe it to be some kind of wiring behind the mirror but as samantha peered through the hole she could see that it wasn't just the inside of a wall it was an entire secret room by the third video it was time for her to pass through the portal into narnia or whatever the hell was on the other side of the mirror john tried to stop her but he clearly didn't try that hard since she was just standing there filming her for tiktok with a <laughs> gotta get that clout <laughs> With a hairband holding a flashlight on her head and a hammer in her hand for protection, Samantha crawled through the hole. Once she had lowered herself into the hidden room, she immediately realized that she wouldn't be able to reach the hole to climb back out and that she would need to find an alternative exit. John handed the phone back to her so that she could record the video from inside while he presumably went to draft an ad looking for a new roommate in case she never returned. <laughs> Finding a secret room behind a wall in your apartment would be pretty creepy. It would also be great. You'd be like, oh, this is. De I'm going to knock this out. We'll turn this into a games room. This will definitely increase. If I found a secret room in my apartment or my house, I'd be like, sweet, extra square meterage. That's going to increase the value of my property. Brilliant. 
This place is freaking awesome! But as Samantha navigated the space she had entered, she suddenly realized it wasn't just a room behind her mirror, it was an entire three-bedroom apartment. The apartment clearly wasn't in use in any official capacity. The floors were torn up, and there was an old toilet sitting in the middle of one of the rooms. And no, it wasn't in the bathroom, you smart ass. However, Samantha did see what she referred to as signs of life. There were some trash bags throughout the rooms, and there was an empty water bottle that clearly hadn't been there very long. She also realized that all the windows were wide open, the obvious source of the cold air that was leaking into her bathroom. Unable to climb back through the hole in which she entered, Samantha eventually located and exited through the front door of this secret apartment and navigated her way back through the building to her apartment. So, from next door. <laughs> Her final TikTok video ended with her hanging the bathroom mirror back up and stating that she was going to have a fun call with her landlord the next day. While the obvious answer might be that it was just an older apartment that was being renovated, Samantha was insistent that she'd never heard any construction sounds. Even if that was the case, it doesn't really explain why the two apartments would be connected by a secret passage behind her mirror. So, how does this story end? Were the trash bags and water bottle a sign that some squatter was living behind Samantha's mirror? Or was she somehow oblivious to the sounds of contractors on the other side of the wall? Or was there some other explanation? Perhaps that none of this even happens. Nah, okay, I've got to disqualify myself. The question is, did it happen? It happened. I don't remember if she faked it or not, but uh, I, I already knew this one, so I'm going to not give myself any points there, but also not give any points there. Unless it does turn out to be completely made up, in which case Kevin's definitely going to get a point, because then I'm just completely making up a memory of, like, I don't think I saw the video, but I read a story about this. Cheechclear.asf the internet can be a pretty terrible place. We've mentioned various disturbing images and videos that have been passed around the early internet like Goatsy and Tubgirl. Oh my god, yeah. Why do I have to be reminded of Goatsy and Tubgirl? What was the reason? What was the reason? What was the reason? But those are extraordinarily tame compared to Cheech Clear, one of the internet's first beheading videos. Despite Simon's love of gore, <laughs> no Kevin, I have no love of gore. As you well know, <laughs> I'll keep my description as minimal as possible for the sake of the audience. The film was made by Chechen insurgents during the First Chechen War in 1996. The victim was a Russian soldier who looks to be about 18 to 20 years old. The video begins with him laying on the grounds with the boot on his head. The insurgents put a knife to his throat and begin to saw. It's painful enough to watch the blood pouring from the wound, but those who have seen it, the most memorable part is the sound of air whistling through the man's windpipe as it's severed. After the execution begins, the film cuts to a later point where the head is no longer attached to the body. <laughs> Jesus. Videos like this were surprisingly common during the Chechen Wars, and there are several of them available, but please don't go looking. The Chechens would record executions and leave the videos for the Russians to find as a form of intimidation. But once someone found that video, it would only be a matter of time before a copy got made, and then another, and the next thing you know, there's a growing community of people who had borne witness to the horrors through the black market, through black market VHS tapes. Or they could just speed up the whole process by airing it on national television either way. Jesus Christ, no one's airing that on national TV. And people who are seeking this out out. If you're thinking, I'm going to go Google that right now, instead of Googling that, search uh, therapist in my local area. <laughs> okay, and when Google asks, do you want Google to know your location? Click yes. Please. Instead. And I'm not joking. I'm for real. I'm for real. In 1999, the video was purchased by Russian media, who aired it on Channel 2. No, they didn't. At this point, it was the beginning of the Second Chechen War, and Russia wanted to portray the Chechens as brutal savages to increase public support for the war. I sort of understand this, as American media would report on videos of ISIS beheadings that show still images before the execution, but airing a full snuff film on TV seems like a step too far for me. Yeah, it does. And uh, yeah, that's don't do that. The still images, I've seen those still images, and it's enough. It's enough. I don't need more than that. Thank you very much. In the early 2000s, the video began to show up on the internet on shock and gore sites with the name Chech Clear ASF. ASF was a type of video format that was used for early video streaming, and it's unclear whether the grainy video quality in the files available online was the result of camera or the ASF file type. The video quickly became notorious, but there were several mysteries surrounding it. First is the name. Nobody actually knows what Chech Clear is supposed to mean. Well, the Chech part's obvious, right? That's Chechen. Don't know what Clear means. Chech Clear? Um, the Chech part is obviously that it's from the First Chechen War, but beyond that, nobody really knows. That also assumed that the file name actually had any real significance, which is not a guarantee. Yeah, but if it if it if cleared wasn't anything, you'd just be like ASDF, wouldn't you? Chech ASDF or Chech one two three, you know, you just mash the keyboard. But clear is 
those letters are all different places so it's not going to be a coincidence that that's what you know came up if so no one's mashing the keyboard and accidentally getting clear next to the people involved to this day nobody has been able to identify either the victim or the executioner and it's absolutely not for lack of trying there is debate as to whether the victim was even a russian soldier or if he was a mercenary and while several names of soldiers that went mia have been suggested it is clear from a cursory glance that none of them are the person in chech clear likewise several people have been put forth as the possible executioner pretty much any time a chechen soldier was arrested for war crimes that person was declared to be the identity of the person in chech clear but this was never actually the case the final mystery surrounding this is a piece of lost media how can a video that is readily available on youtube be considered lost media you ask well the video i described earlier is only 15 seconds long and it contains an obvious cut seconds after the throat is first slashed jumping into the final bit where the head is fully decapitated however there is believed to be a longer five minute version of the video than what was originally aired on channel 2 in russia back in the early 2000s online videos were extremely short people were only just starting to make the switch from dial-up to cable internet when the video first appeared so expecting people to watch a five-minute video that would probably take you days to download wasn't realistic it's claimed that the worst of what happened in is in the 15 seconds that are online today and the remainder of the video is just the russian being beaten and humiliated before he's eventually laid down on the ground for his execution these claims have existed for at least a decade but to date no concrete information about a longer version of the video has been discovered i'm sure i'm just giving simon a free point with this entry because of his undoubtedly encyclopedic knowledge of all the various stuff films he's watched jesus what's that you say if this video really exists what if anything does chech clear mean will either the victim or the executioner ever be identified um i'm inclined to believe that this one disturbingly is real it feels real like all the details i mean i know kevin's getting better at this with each <laughs> with each round of these that we do but all of the details like channel 2 in russia and them only airing this and then the comparison to what the americans do i'm like i believe this one and i know there's like lots of horrible execution videos on the internet because people are sick so uh i'm saying yeah it's real the diy bonanza in 2016 an unnamed ohio couple were performing some diy house renovations this couple who had probably watched too many house flipping shows had purchased a house originally built in the 1940s with the intention of giving it a complete remodel they started with the main living spaces on the first and second floor of the house and everything had gone according to plan <laughs> yeah i watched i watched so many episodes of grand designs and uh the 18 months ago my wife and i purchased a house that needed a lot of work a lot of work let's just say it's 18 months later and we don't live there huh? <laughs> and it's been and it's not for lack of trying there's um i mean i'm not doing the renovations myself because i'm not insane and i can't wield a hammer for shit. but there's a there's been a team of building dudes in there for like well it took a year to get permissions like because it's like a protected um area so you have to get all of these crazy building permissions and everything like signed off by the government who take forever and for the last six months it's just been it's just been non-stop building and i think it'll be another year it never ends never ends what have i done once the rest of the house was done it was time for the project that the couple had been dreading the basement they knew that this was going to be the hardest part of the job but it couldn't be put off any longer yeah and in this house i bought the dot it's like a big converted basement but the people who did the last conversion didn't do a very good job and so there's like dampness leaking in and they're like the the people who did the survey are like yeah you need to rip all of this out and then you need to redo it on the outside like properly <laughs> and i'm like how much is that gonna cost and they're like this amount and i'm like ah why huh why not they knew this was going to be the hardest part of the job but it couldn't be put off any longer while the wife was at work the husband began the job tearing down the old dropped ceiling <laughs> He had been showcasing the entire renovation process on Reddit and Facebook for an undoubtedly apathetic audience, so when one of the drop ceiling tiles came crashing to the floor, revealing an object hidden in the rafters, he immediately took out his phone and started documenting. Hiding in the ceiling, wedged tightly between some plumbing and the rafters, was an old green and grey lunchbox. Being a considerate husband, he decided to wait until his wife returned home from work before opening it. It seems that he gave up working for the day and just stared at the lunchbox, dreaming about what fantastical treasures could be inside it. When the wife returned, time from work the couple decided to delay the reveal while they speculated on what could be inside who the f doesn't just i don't believe this is real because if i found that when i was doing renovations i'd immediately be like it's junk let's open it and see if there's any money inside there'd be no money inside and then i'll throw it away i wouldn't be like waiting for my wife to get home to open a lunchbox which would then just disappoint us both no i don't believe it kevin i don't believe it 
But then maybe it's one of those ones. I mean, people also on Reddit want that clout, you know, so they want to tell an interesting story. He thought it was filled with antique baseball cards, while she guessed that maybe it was a bunch of old recipes. Yes, who puts recipes in an old lunchbox and then hides it in a false ceiling? Aside from being, I'm assuming a dropped ceiling is what we'd call a false ceiling. Like where you just lower it a little bit to do like, we've just done this in this bloody house. <laughs> Anytime a house renovations come up, I'm like, house renovations? <laughs> Let me tell you about house renovations. Yeah, they've just done this in the in the house because they, they had to rip, the whole thing had to have all of its electrics ripped out and redone, which is insane. And so the, the ceiling was lowered, like maybe by this much because they had to run all these things and then put these like bracings in to hold like light things and all of this. Oh my god. <laughs> this is like, uh, what, 50% of my conversations outside of work are right now, so... Yeah, and it's been that way for like a year. <laughs> House renovations, man, it never ends. Aside from being needlessly stereotypical, gender-normative guesses, they were also really stupid guesses. The lunchbox had been very deliberately hidden for quite a long time. But sports cards would have been worthless when the case was first squirreled away, and I can guarantee that your family's secret recipe for paella from the old country isn't special enough to require this level of secrecy. It had to be something that would actually be worth hiding. Once they finally got around to opening the lunchbox, uh, they found three bundles wrapped in wax paper. One bundle contained $20 bills, the other $50 bills, and the third was hundreds. The money was old but it was crisp there was thousands of dollars with the dates on the bills ranging from 1928 to 1934 beneath the money was newspaper from 1953 providing evidence as to exactly how long it had been hidden up there after a little investigation the couple discovered that some of the old bills were rare uncirculated bills that were worth more than their face value in total the contents were worth twenty-three thousand dollars. i'd love to know how much the cash was i'd love to know what the cash value was because 1923 or let's say 1930 um i'm not sure what inflation would have done to that money but it's at least, I'd say, 20 times. I'm not sure what inflation's done. So if you put a dollar in there, that in, instead, like, it would be worth, it was $20 back in the day, and now it's just worth $1. So it's lost 20 times its value, which is, like, why it's not brilliant to find cash. Because that person probably thought they were putting, like, equivalent of, like, half a million dollars away or whatever in their money. And then in, in modern terms, it's, like, 20 grand. And you're like, oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> much better to just hide some gold up there it's also smaller okay so maybe the former owner of the house didn't trust banks the bills were dated to the great depression a time when confidence in banks was at an all-time low on account of them constantly going out of business the latest dated bills were 1934 which coincides with when the fdic was created to insure deposits once the excitement of finding someone's life savings had died down it was time for the couple to get back to work the husband found a second lunchbox hidden in the ceiling while his wife was at work again this time they didn't f around and immediately posted pictures of the contents to reddit when she returned home it was an identical lunchbox but instead of a few bundles of cash, it was completely packed end to end with neatly placed and organized bills. I'll be like, oh, I wish it was gold. You had to use cash. It's lost so much value. I want to know where the gold is. Like. I want the gold. Give me the gold. I want the gold. Oh, fun aside. I mean, this isn't interesting for anyone in America, but I was, I, I, I really found it interesting that any, like, a, these bills from, like, the 1920s, like a $5 bill or whatever, still you could just go to it and use it in a shop. Like, I went to, I tried to pay for something the other day, and they were like, you can't use this. And I'm like, what do you mean? And like, it's the last series of bills. These went out, like, five years ago. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it does look slightly different. <laughs> It's like, we change the money, and then it becomes invalid, and you have to go to a bank to swap it. Which I didn't do. It's like, it was like $5 equivalent, so I'm like, I'm not going to go and do that. But I'll just keep it in my pocket until I spend it in a store that someone does. I think I've already spent it. <laughs> I'll just try and spend it with someone who doesn't notice. I remember when I worked in a shop, and some Canadian guy came in, and he had like a £20 note, but it was like two, it was like 20 years old. And it, I, know, I don't, this is, I, I don't know what this is, but we don't accept your joker money here. The money was newer than the bills from the first lunchbox, and much of it was in those bundles you get from a bank with little pieces of paper around them saying how much is inside. There were $1,000 bundles of 20s and $5,000 bundles of 100s, along with some other loose bills. In total, the second lunchbox contained $45,000. Um, I think they bundle things in ten thousands, not five thousands. I mean, I might just be based. I mean, I'm entirely basing that on movies I've seen because I'm not seeing like <laughs> that much cash, like American cash. Like, I think they bundle it in ten k's. So I'm leaning towards this being fake. There's also a few things that are like going off in my my spidey brain about this one, but it could also be because these people are on Reddit telling a story. 
Woo! What do you think, audience? In total, the second lunchbox contained forty-five thousand dollars. Which, if it's from nineteen thirty, that'd be like a million dollars. And instead, it's just forty-five. That's so disappointing. Now they realize that the house was full of treasure. The couple decided to investigate as thoroughly as possible. This led to what they described as a secret door. It was a plainly visible utility access panel that the realtor had told them led to the hot water heater. They never actually bothered to open up the panel because they assumed it was just a tiny space with a water heater. But now that the house was revealing its secrets, they felt it was worth taking a look. Oh, what you'd never open the little door to your water heater you've never been like curious about what's in there you'd never had to like turn it off to go on holiday or something i don't believe it kevin i mean i don't believe it or i don't believe the people on reddit <laughs> which complicates matters behind the access panel was not a water heater it was an entire secret room the floor and there's no way a realtor wouldn't find this out the floor was covered with large mismatched carpet squares but that was pretty much it though the secret room was unimpressive it contained a door to an even more secret room the door is secret rooms all the way down this other door had multiple heavy-duty locks, including a combination lock. Undeterred, the husband was able to eventually break all the locks and force the door open. The new room looked exactly like the sort of room someone would want to hide. The walls had heavy layers of soundproofing and were covered with wire tarp. On the floor was an old leather briefcase and a portable fire safe. They opened the briefcase first, since that didn't require any effort. Inside was a collection of expensive antique watches and other jewelry, as well as silver ingots. There were also envelopes full of large amounts of foreign currency. Next, the husband forced his way into the safe. He was immediately greeted with a piece of paper that had the words, Save Yourself, scrawled in dripping blank ink, black ink. The inside lid had the words, Do Not, painted on in whiteout. As for the contents of the safe, it was a pile of videotapes that were labeled in various and somewhat unclear ways. Based on the labels in the image posted to Reddit, it looks like the top layer of tapes were probably from 1994 to 1995 with some additional form of cataloging. But the tapes, which were already suspicious, took on a more sinister turn when the label on one of them was shown to simply read, No, 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 no. The couple thought better of watching the tapes and did their best to leave it well enough alone. Obviously, that didn't last long, and after a few days, they decided to watch what was on the tapes. Despite claiming that the contents were horrific, they also said they watched all six tapes to make sure that they were the same sort of content. Bro. I don't want to know even think about what's on those tapes. But who's like, let's watch all six, just to be sure. <laughs> Just want to scar my brain up real hard. Immediately after watching the tapes, they called the police, who in turn called the FBI. The FBI showed up as fast as possible to confiscate the tapes and conduct an investigation, and the couple were ordered to remove all of their posts about their house renovations from the internet. So what was on those tapes, Simon? And was it related to all the hidden valuables in the home, or was this made up? Because I'm the one who's been watching too many house flipping shows. I think this is 100% made up. It's like, it reads like a creepypasta. And I don't know what to say if, like, what if... It's not made up, and it's the people on Reddit made it up. If, it, if this is any way made up, or not backed up by evidence, like the FBI police, this actually happening, I'm claiming a win on this one, okay? Mima's Room Mima was a 1990s Brazilian pop star, a member of the girl band Cham, because all of the best bands have exclamation points in, there in the end, like Attack Attack and Attack Attack. Yes, those are two very real and unrelated bands, one from the UK and one from the US. What sort of name for that isn't a band anyway? Attack Attack? It's like Attack Attack exclamation point. Attack exclamation point. Attack exclamation point. So, I don't know. I've never heard of them. I've never heard of Cham. I don't care. In 1997, Mima decided that she was going to follow in the footsteps of so many pop sensations before her and make the transition from music idol to serious actor. She landed a role on a drama called Double Binds. Originally, I thought this was a sort of awkward translation, but it's apparently an actual phrase. Double binds? Okay. <laughs> Double binds are kind of complicated and nuanced, but the short version is that it's explicitly or implicitly relaying two conflicting messages, like a mother saying, I love you to a child while slapping them hard across the face. Oh my god, <laughs> these tactics are employed by a lot of abusers and can be a total and complete mind for the victim. In the show Double Bind, Mima was playing the role of one such victim. It was pretty dark content, up to and including a character being sexually abused. The good news is that this was the Brazilian version of the 1990s basic cable rather than HBO, so the worst acts would have been implied or taken place off camera. The bad news is that despite being able to land the role thanks to her fame, Mima was wasn't an actor. It's also believed that she had some undisclosed pre-existing psychological condition that made the entire situation much harder for her to handle. To film 20 episodes of an hour-long drama would take roughly 160 days of shooting, probably all consecutively, and she was not mentally prepared for the psychological abuse that her character was supposed to be enduring. They do take days off. They don't film 160 days in a row without a day off. I listen to podcasts where people about people who've made TV shows and stuff, and it's often like they'll take a day off, like a Sunday or a Saturday, and then they come back and they start again on Monday like normal normal people they don't have to work 
forever like non-stop mima began having a difficult time telling the difference between fantasy and reality a condition that reached new levels when she read a fan letter that led her to discover the website mima's room mima's room was basically just a daily blog written as a diary for the public what had caught her attention in the fan letter and made her actually look at the site rather than ignoring it is the site claimed to be written by mima herself people lie on the internet all the time and that wasn't any less true in 1997 so her first thought would have been it was some sort of hoax and troll however most of the details in the diary were accurate it wasn't all a bunch of deep personal feelings that nobody else in the world could have possibly known but whoever was writing mima's room seemed to know what she was doing every day and had some amount of insight into her personality that is creepy you are creepy as that's the sort of thing if i discovered i'd be like okay i'm just gonna ask my mates whether this is real and check with them and if they're like yeah this is real and creepy i'm gonna be like okay cool gonna call the police and if they're like bro you, this isn't real this isn't actually what happens then you need then i'd see a psychiatrist mima showed the sign to her manager and was told to just ignore it normally i'd agree with that don't read the comments sort of mentality <laughs> thumbs up for that one but it may not be the best advice in what sounds like could have been a case of pretty severe stalking it didn't matter though because mima didn't take the advice she wanted to see just how much this person knew about her as the weeks of filming went on mima's psychological state continued to suffer not only was the intense nature of the show having a serious impact on her mental health but she was becoming increasingly obsessed with mima's room in the beginning it was almost entirely accurate but the online diary began to significantly diverge from her real life causing her even more confusion and unease wait no then i'd be like this is making me feel more comfortable because i'd be like okay at first I'd, you could be like okay just chalk it up to coincidence maybe it's someone who knows me maybe it's someone on the production crew and then i'd just start doing more weird <laughs> like i'd throw some curveballs in there that they wouldn't know about and then they wouldn't appear on the blog because my behavior had become more unpredictable <laughs> right this sounds like exactly the sort of thing that i turned like a schizophrenic would tell to like a psychiatrist right <laughs> God, it's so creepy. In one instance, Mima's manager walked in on her in a nearly catatonic state as she scrolled through the diary saying, So that's what I did today. Her psyche eventually became so damaged that she began referring to the author of the diary posts as Real Mima. Then, two weeks before filming for Double Blind concluded, Mima van vanished. Suspicion immediately fell on her manager. The belief was that she was angry at Mima for giving up a lucrative career as a singer along with the manager's 20% in exchange for what was undoubtedly going to be a failed acting career. Her manager would have known her daily activities, details about her personal life that may not have been public, and about her fragile mental state. Though authorities believed that she either ran the website herself or was feeding information to the person that did, police couldn't find any evidence to link her to the site. They also couldn't rule out the possibility of a stalker. Ultimately, Mima was never found, but what happened to her? Who was responsible? I mean, all of society was responsible by stigmatizing mental health care but who was responsible for creating mima's room assuming any of this really happens was it a manager a random stalker or something else i am inclined to believe this one so we've got so far just to keep a reminder on things the tiktok mirror that's uh it's it's real uh well, but i'm not getting a point for that we've got the heading beheading one which is real we got the diy bonanza which i don't believe and i need to see some evidence for we've got mima's room which i do believe and we've got now campus gene editing okay in early 2009 a group of students from the university of miami were wandering around campus one night bored though the buildings were all closed after hours except for the dorms obviously they happened to be privy to a little known secret on campus on the side of the cox science building was an elevator that provided access to the roof of the building there wasn't actually anything interesting to do on the roof there were some hvac vents a locked door that led to the stairs and presumably a nice view of the campus your typical roof stuff as reddit user and obvious south park fan loves to spooge explains the roof was just as boring as anywhere else else at night we only like to hang out there because we knew we weren't supposed to and because it was funny to ask each other you want to go on top of cox <laughs> Ah. But on the night that all of this started, the roof wasn't empty. At first it appeared to be, but taped on the door to the stairs was a piece of paper with a QR code. LTS was the only one of them that had a smartphone, so he tried scanning the code. What are the odds that only one of them had a smartphone? Oh, loves to spooch. That's the one guy. Okay, so I'm already like, one of them had a smartphone, only one? They were just hanging out without their phones? <laughs> what is this, 1983? The page it took him to looked like it was blank, so he just shoved the paper in his pocket and decided to try it on his computer. Later that night, when he arrived, he'd just take a picture of it. He wouldn't 
take the paper. Later that night, when he arrived back in his dorm, LTS looked at the website that he had been directed to so he could type it into his computer. Rather than being a domain name, the website just used an IP address, a practice that was barely ever common in the first place and hadn't been for probably 10 years at that point. When viewing the site on the computer, he saw that the page was almost entirely blank except for an unmarked button in the bottom corner of the page. When he clicked on the button, a message popped up that instructed him to check back the next day to begin the test. LTS tried the website again and the same thing happened, and I'm not really sure what else he would have expected. He went to the newly formed r slash what is this thing subreddit i know that that's real to see if anyone had ever seen a website like it his initial fear was that this was sort of some strange way of infecting his devices with a virus so he only posted screenshots of the site rather than link to it so as not to spread the virus if there was one yeah you're like no 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 i don't need any like viruses thank you the lack of link made people skeptical, but they instructed him on how to view the source code for the page so that he could copy and paste it. These instructions literally take two clicks, and it blows my mind that someone could get into college in the late 2000s without knowing how to view the source code for a page regardless of whether they understand it, but maybe I'm just a giant nerd. Yeah, Kevin, you are a giant nerd. Like, you are a nerd. That's true. Like, I know how to do that. I think a lot of people know how to do that, but... If I ask my wife to like, can you show me the source code for this website? She'd be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> what is code? <laughs> what? What is source code? And she has two degrees. <laughs> like, it's not like, people don't know this. She'd probably be like, wait, how do you right click on a Mac? <laughs> oh God, okay. Anyway, the helpful people of Reddit were able to look through the tiny bit of code and determine that it was indeed not a virus. All the button did was send his IP to an anonymous email. But their estimation was that this served two purposes. The first was to let whoever set up the site know that someone had actually visited it. There's no way to know how long the QR code had been taped there before LTS found it, but now that he had, it meant that the site might update the next day. The other suggested purpose was to check the IP address. Universities often have a dedicated range of IPs, so you can easily tell from a person's IP whether or not they're using the school's network to access the internet they can't track your exact location though so if you're listening to this episode from a dorm room don't get all panicked and maybe take advantage of today's sponsor surfshark vpn that would be perfect if it was actually sponsored by surfshark vpn wouldn't it a couple of days later lts went back to the website and sure enough it had changed the site was now password protected with the prompt asking him to enter his ip after doing so he was presented as promised with a literal test of 100 multiple choice questions i'm sorry if that guy doesn't know how to view source code on a on a website he has no idea how to find out what his ip address is oh i suppose he could google like what is my ip rather than doing in command prompts okay so maybe he could do that okay i'll let that go after doing so his prompts presented as promised with a literal test of 100 multiple choice questions he as he posted screenshots and the source code to reddit again and began filling out the test honestly to the best of his abilities fortunately for our story he checked back on reddit before hitting submit whatever method was being used to grade the test was all being done server side so they couldn't determine that from the page's source code but after reading the questions they were able to convince lts to change his answers this test was a psychological set questionnaire of sorts it was all opinion based but it had a very clear conspiratorial tone to it with questions like under which of these circumstances would news networks conceal the truth for the public good after changing his answers to the most unhinged conspiracy loving answers possible lts hit the submit button a new page loaded that said you've passed the first test here's some reading material to get you started come back again tomorrow i don't believe this like i don't believe i mean it's kevin the problem is with these it blurs the lines because i don't believe that this is mm, i mean but do I believe that some bored student stuck a QR code up on the top of a roof and then did this? Yeah, I believe that. I believe that. I believe this happened because people are like students are bored and they're like, let's just let's just mess around. Let's just do this for no reason whatsoever. Uh, accompanying the text was a link to a PDF file. The PDF was o allegedly over 100 pages long, though he only screenshotted about half a dozen pages of it to share. What he showed were the original blueprints for the Cox Science Building, along with an altered version of the blueprints that indicated the locations of secret rooms and laboratories. There wasn't any proof that these secret locations existed, at least not in anything that was shared online. They were just drawn onto the blueprints. The other pages that were screenshotted seemed to indicate the belief that there was an experimental gene research going on and again there was no proof just a lot of conspiratorial talk interestingly the ramblings do include the word crispr had it specifically mentioned crispr cas9 that would have been a bombshell as the tool wouldn't be invented until 2012 but the dna sequencer defined as crispr was first identified in 1987. all it showed was that the author had at least a vague understanding of the topic but nothing that was uploaded gave anything even resembling proof of the conspiracy allegations they were leveling while those following the story were becoming less convinced in its of its authenticity they were still anxious to see how this was all going to play out 
The next day, LTS went back to the website, entered his IP as a password, and when he did, the screen simply read, You shouldn't have told Reddit, Stanford, fourth floor. Stanford was one of the dorm buildings on campus, but it wasn't the one where LTS lived. He opted not to say which of the other buildings he lived in. It was the consensus among those that believed the story that the mention of a building and floor was just a random guess to try and intimidate him. <laughs> If he was wrong, he may have felt it was some sort of instruction or hidden message, and if he lived there, well, they would have likely scared him less. But not everybody believed his story. Some people believed that it was just a hoax, while others felt it was meant to be an alternate reality game that LTS hadn't planned out very well, so he gave up. What do you think, Simon? Obviously, the information about a conspiracy was all but did these events happen to LTS as he described, or was it all pretend? A story that he either made up to fool the internet, or that I made up to fool you. Okay, so there you go. I think it's, um... No, I'm gonna say it happened to him, because I think the guy who's making it up is the guy with the QR code. Like, there's no there's no secret labs and gene editing. But I believe that this happened to him, and it's a fun story that someone made up for him. So, just a reminder, gene editing I think is real. Mima's room I think is real. The DIY bonanza I think is... Is that really what I said? Do I believe so many are real? Mima's room is real. Um, the DIY Bonanza, I believe, is... Did I say that was fake? Yeah, I think I definitely said that was fake, right? That's fake. And Chech Clear is real. And the first one, I don't get. I've got to go watch it on Premiere Pro. <laughs> I'm back, and Kevin destroyed me. <laughs> well, the first one, we neither of us get any points, because I knew it. The second one about the the Chechen thing, I get a point because Kevin thought it uh, Kevin it was true, and yeah, I thought it was true. The DIY bonanza was true, which is insane. And the FBI and stuff did actually show up, and I'm like, that's absolutely mental. That sounds like a completely made up story, which is nuts. Uh, Mimu is also true. Kevin got me with the bloody anime thing. He was like, it's an anime, Simon. I'm like. <laughs> Okay. Uh, and the CRISPR one that I said was true, even though I thought, I, I, even though I was kind of like, well, I think it's all b****, but I do believe that it was posted to Reddit or whatever. It wasn't. Kevin totally made it up. So, uh, yeah, well done, Kevin. And I'll see you next time.